Part 11. The Nature of Beneficial Interests Lost at Sea and Beneficial Interests in the Estate As we proceed further away from what most people think is real into the realms of fiction, metaphor, esoteric symbolism, and systems, many will go into cognitive dissonance and disconnect from the storyline and threads we have been weaving into the overall fabric of the world system of bondage. That is how the construction of reality we exist in has been designed, to carefully and comprehensively create the automatic rejection of facts right in front of us and to program ourselves with a blanket acceptance of the mythologies and projections that we have been trained to see as real. The cognitive dissonance associated with those who would only accept what they can prove before them is purposeful and by design. This enables those who know how to manipulate reality by using the esoteric tools that have been handed down through those lineages for millennia have been the designers of that facade, and it has worked very well for them indeed. Ultimately, reality is in the mind of the beholder. This then gets into the issues of quantum systems, in which the observed is inextricably bound with the observer. It falls within the adage, tell them a lie long enough and consistently enough, and they will accept it as true. Ultimately, we cannot force someone to see what he or she do not want to see, nor to awaken from the slumber to which they are attached and to which they have grown accustomed. But for those with eyes to see, or the willingness to temporarily suspend disbelief and consider the possibilities of what is presented herein, the understanding of the esoteric nature of the underlying order of things is essential, keeping in mind that our working definition of esoteric here is simply that which is hidden from plain sight while at the same time being revealed in plain sight. These are the things that are hidden in plain sight, the esoteric. But these are very real and quite tangible to those who have been trained to utilize such for the manipulation and entrainment of mass consciousness, to project the desired reality into the holographic field of manifestation in order to dominate and control. This is done by the power of media and technology that utilizes the knowledge of frequencies, mind control, entrainment, patterned repetition, and much more. If one truly wishes to be free, then the first thing that must go is the insistence on a reality construct that has been inculcated, programmed, and hardwired into one's consciousness in order to utilize our creator capacities to sustain our prison a large part of which is the knee-jerk reaction against anything that is not normal. This spoon-fed reality construct includes the vilifying of the unseen, the supernatural, the esoteric, and the occult. Remember, the corollary to the adage above is, tell them where they cannot go or they will pay the price of excommunication if they do to keep the conforming populace maintained within self-imposed limitation. The issue of being lost at sea reflects back to the Sestake V Act of 1666, enacted in the same year that the reconstruction of the City of London was initiated. The Sestake V Act provides for how estates shall be passed on to heirs and beneficiaries in order to settle the estate if a man is lost at sea and presumed dead. When we are lost at sea and presumed dead, we have abandoned our estate, the landed estate, the Ba-di. We are licensed to float on the Sea of Commerce in what is effectively a ghost ship, and since we are then effectively enemies of the state, the attorneys are authorized to board our vessels or ships and effect legal piracy operating under bar cards as letters of mark and reprisal. We have all been made enemies of the state through the operation of various acts and proclamations, and thus the bar attorneys are allowed to board the ships of commerce that we float in so they can legally plunder them for booty and prize. Once secured, they must reprise such booty back to the sovereign under whose flag they sail, 
the Crown via its commercial extension of the British East India Company, also known as the United States, and keep their fair share via the courts and the plunder of the bonded estates. To reclaim our life and estate, we must follow the requirements of the SESTA-KV Act by returning from the sea. This raises the question, why is commerce a field of battle? To answer this, we have a look at the maxims of commerce that many have used in their pursuit of freedom by applying these within commercial administrative processes that presumably lead to perfected default judgments. One such maxim states, he who leaves the field of battle first loses. There it is, front and center. It is this very maxim that is promoted by those who believe commercial processes will lead to victory and freedom, positing that when a commercial contract styled as an affidavit of obligation is not responded to, that such lack of response is the equivalent of the opponent leaving the field of battle first, and thus securing victory. Unfortunately, with all the logic in the commercial process notwithstanding, the fatal flaw is that it is a bait and hook that many have fallen for because once they initiate the process onto the field of battle, they are guilty of using paper in the domestic-slash-federal zone, and therefore it doesn't matter if the opponent leaves the field of battle first. They have been licensed to operate in commerce and cannot deny that acceptance because they are now issuing commercial paper and filing commercial liens. They have not severed the surety relationship thereto, and thus are subject to suppression for the acts of revolt and insurrection per Section 4 of the 14th Amendment. To avoid this pitfall, one must prove that he or she is alive and not lost at sea, step onto the land, and claim one's ancestral estate and genetic lineage, and with that corrected status and standing then provide for the settlement of all claims against the public decedent estate and thus return to the land of the living. The caveat, of course, is that once one has corrected their status by removing themselves from the field of battle, they can no longer go back into commerce and re-engage belligerent activities. If they do, it is the equivalent of raising a flag of peace and then going to the center of the field under truce to meet with the opposing officers to negotiate a settlement and then pulling out a gun and shooting the commanding officer once the two opposing parties meet in the middle. If that occurs, the offended army will mobilize its forces and attack forthwith. The same is true if we remove ourselves and proclaim to be standing in peace and a neutral in the public, only to then turn around and attack officers of the other side. Thus, it is critical to not just do pieces of paper, but to actually internalize the process and deal with one's inner battlefield in going to peace, i.e., to address the enemy construct within us. The real twist to all of it is that the way out is now the way in. The Holy See is the adjudicating body that controls commerce through the Roman Curia, inclusive of all civil procedures and codes and all those bound to it, as described above. The Holy See is the English version of the Latin Sancta Sedes. This is why the motif of SS is found in many places, the SS of the Nazis, the SS of Social Security, as well as being the name of the paramount goddess of history, Isis, which combines the SS with the two pillars. The SS is in fact symbolic of two intertwining snakes representative of the double helix of the DNA. At the pinnacle of the world judicial system sits the Roman Curia, which is the judicial arm of the Holy See. The entire judicial system of the world is constructed on top of ecclesiastical law to be controlled under Roman Catholic Church canons. But the true definition of the term ecclesiastical is derived from its root, ecclesia, defined as the body of the congregation. 
This is the physical, genetically sound, fully expressed living embodiments of individualized life expression and the aggregate whole of the world body. The world population constitutes this intended body that is by creational mandate designed to be completely self-directed by and through sovereign free will expression. Yet the world system has entrained our sovereign free will to be bound and constrained within the containment field of the civil body as a fictional containment field, a holographic overlay, until such time as we muster up the capacity to begin the journey of walking into life by leaving such binding constraints behind. This is the true meaning of walking into life which is to withdraw our free will participation out of the world system matrix and redirect it towards building a world based on the honoring of all life. The word matrix is based on the etymological root for the words mother, matter, and material. This is the true source of our physical presence in this world. The entire world system is a false light projection to get us to contract to the fictional matrix in lieu of bringing our true and full spirit into our bodies and being the co-creative source-aligned beings we were intended to be. The false matrix reality that we have bonded ourselves to enables our life force to be the propagating force for the construction of the world system. It also establishes our voluntary residency in a reality construct that is a fictional solimitude of the real thing. Among other places, the map and guidance to achieve release from the matrix is encoded in the Bible and referred to in metaphor as to be born again. That phrase has very little to do with what those without eyes think it does, and for those with eyes to see has everything to do with establishing a road map of how to walk out of the clutches of death and back into life. The surface road map of religious bondage in the Bible is just another misdirection to get one to voluntarily bind oneself to perpetual enslavement, to bind and bind again. This is why we state herein that waiting to be saved by some false concept of a one and only Godson Savior is the misdirection that it is. It places one's own power outside of oneself and subconsciously contracts with the tenets established by the papal bulls quoted above that contain the ultimate nexus for bondage in subjugation to the will of the Father in heaven in the form of the Papa, or Pope, in Rome. Many will argue that they do not do that, but in fact, no matter what one thinks, there are energetic bonds hardwired into the belief systems contained in the Bible about a Savior and the rest of it that do exactly that. This has nothing to do with that true motivating force of our heart-centered faith in an ineffable essence of spirit. It has to do with seeing the falsity of the Roman construction to get bondage entrainment by contractual agreement with that which will enslave us and own us forever, or until we finally wake up to these truths. There is a vast difference between allowing oneself to be entrained in a belief system that has been craftily built over thousands and millions of years for this purpose versus piercing the veils of illusion and finally seeing with real eyes to realize the truth of the matter. We reject the idea of God because it is a false construct, just as the idea of the One is a false construct. They are both programs in the matrix. Their purpose is to blind our true knowing through our hearts of our real relationship with that vast power of creation that we can refer to as source, out of which our lives flow as individuated source-originated life streams in co-creative synchronicity as we express our individual unique qualities within the context of universal principles of life, creation, and transcendent law. 
The ultimate manifestation of all of this leads us to the discussion of beneficiaries and beneficial interests in our ancestral estate, our lineal genetic embodiment in these bodies of ours. Such beneficial interests go beyond even the linear construct and three-dimensional reality of this planet. They pierce to the center of who we are as multidimensional and eternal beings of creation. Our beneficial interests are the claim of life and the life estate that is who we really are. We are the true beneficiaries in the manifest expression of our source stream life expression. We are the estate and the beneficiary. In the fictional inversion of this understanding, we have the obverse expression of all roads lead to Rome, which is established by the fact that all these franchises and corporations are ultimately owned by the one of their making the Crown Corporation, as part of the Triple Crown. In the legal system, the device used for this purpose is a very simple one, which is that all entities and owners of property, assets, titles, and so forth, must ultimately end with what is termed the ultimate beneficial owner. This is done ostensibly for compliance and security reasons to control the global boogeyman of terrorism via two requirements known as anti-money laundering and know-your-customer rules. But of course the UBO is always a corporate franchise or corporation, and thus is the Triple Crown. But there is nothing that prevents us from becoming living beings on the free, dry, not underwater, soil of the land upon which we hold and maintain our private estate and being, holding ultimate beneficial interests as our eternal gift of life. Even their rules provide for that, because as stated earlier, there must always be a remedy in law as well as the fact that they know it all must be voluntary, and when one rescinds voluntary adhesion, it must be released. The foundation of this is the true universal principle in terms of equitable interests and true beneficial rights, when stated as, true ownership is vested in the beneficiary, or stated in another way as a maxim of equity, the true owner is the beneficiary. The true being, as such an ultimate beneficial owner, is the unique life essence that each living being exists as is in full expression and co-creative alignment with the sentience of this earth and her physically manifested field of creation. To be here on this earth is a priori evidence that we have entered into a contract with the living presence and sentient awareness of the earth and must honor and align with all of life in reciprocal support thereof. Beneficiaries and Equity Beneficial Rights and Equitable Interests All property in the world system is held within estates. This is neither good nor bad. It just depends on how it is used and applied. In the past, it has been used in the application of creating a hierarchy of elitism that has operated for thousands of years in such a way as to allow all the value and equitable interests to rise to the top of that hierarchical structure to the benefit of the few, while all the burden of the debt bondage has been allowed to settle onto the backs of the world's population to the detriment of the many. But the knowledge and understanding of the world system enables one to rearrange the furniture on the world stage and assert one's capacity to reclaim one's life, estate, and equitable interests. In so doing, those who have in the past been able to play the roles of controller, dominator, warden, and executor are now forced back into their own creation as a constraint within which they must perform as trustees and civil servants in the true sense of those words and offices. All intentions for individual property management within an estate are expressed as trusts. 
Estate and trust law, therefore, are paramount in the world system not commerce or the rest of the misdirection many have been chasing for decades and many are still attempting to apply as solutions in such misguided beliefs. Estate and trust law are matters of equity. Equity is a profoundly beautiful synthesis of universal law expressed in simple yet resonantly all-encompassing maxims. Equity is the expression of balance, equality, equanimity, and resolution in any given matter and in all matters of life when properly applied without manipulation or distortion. Equity aligns self-directive source expression, stated as sovereign free will, with the manifested results of such expression. In other words, when one is living as a whole being, one is the totality of life. This becomes the true word as universal resonance with intent, which becomes the estate in dynamic living expression and is one and the same as the beneficiary holding true ownership, beneficial rights, and equitable interests. In short, we are life, we are equity, we are creation. Leading, of course, to the singular question, what are we going to do with it? It's time to wake up to the fact that we are the B-A-N-C as the beneficiary and never-ending creation. Instead of Rome, London, D.C. as the unholy trinity, it is time to stand as heart, mind, soul, where America is the abbreviation of the true spiritual body, La Mary Ka, where Mary is the sacred feminine principle of the waters of life and the never-ending life stream of source creation expressed in each and every living being, the Mary, the true maritime medium of living fluidity never-ending, where life flows endlessly, where water is the emotional media of our hearts, directed by our sovereign free will as our minds, and integrated with our true being as our souls. This is the real spiritual body, the Ka, that we are here to integrate with our physical embodiments to be here in this world of form, in the ecclesia of the body of the congregation, in communion with each other, and in union with the earth herself. Not the fictional corporation we have allowed ourselves to project into, to give it the similitude of life, but not life itself. We are the true trinity, not the tripartite, triple crown imposter, imposer, interloper. The mechanism of a trust is the method by which we are temporarily separated from the beneficial rights and equitable interests. It is the method of splitting a title whereby two titles are created instead of one integrated whole title or absolute title. Here again we find another trinity, that of settler, trustee, and beneficiary. The settler places or settles something of value into a binding agreement known as a trust indenture. This agreement binds the value of the corpus of the trust, assigning legal title to the trustee and equitable title to the beneficiary. In its pure form, this can be and is a sound method for protecting equitable interests and beneficial rights, such as when the beneficiary is a child or when a man or woman has gone off somewhere and places his or her assets or estate in trust in the event he or she does not return. But in the world system of two-tiered estates, decedent and ancestral, along with many other sleight-of-hand manipulations, the state as the overlying estate has caused roles to be reversed, whereby the living man, woman, or child is placed in the role of trustee and the state itself as beneficiary. The holder of legal title, the trustee, also holds the liabilities, meaning the debt and obligations. When we, the living, are placed as the trustees instead of the beneficiaries, we are thereby converted from the living to the dead, and the true beneficiary to the bonded surety. 
The means and methods by which this is achieved are far beyond the scope of this document, but can be learned, understood, and applied in an effective manner to correct one's status from bonded debt slave to living being. This similitude of life is found in the overlay estate referenced in legal codes as the decedent estate, as discussed previously, where the term decedent by legal definition means dying as opposed to deceased, which means dead. When we bind ourselves to the public codified world system, we are considered and acted upon as a decedent estate, progressively dying bonded to a civilly dead fiction. It is this imposter estate that we have progressively marched into through the corridors of time and history. We first began as the manifested expression of authentic self and a true estate with no split in title or reality. We began as a source-expressed creation and had the power thereof to create at will when creation was not bound in polarity within us versus them, God versus God, God versus devil, me versus you. Along the way, we allowed ourselves to project that creative capacity into things by an incremental method of bait and switch. We projected our spirits and creative capacity into shiny metals such as gold and silver coin, we then allowed that coin to be held in trust by governments or banks or temples that issued warehouse receipts to carry in our pockets and trade for goods and services. Later on, the priests created concepts such as negotiable instruments acts that codified our ability to exchange our pieces of paper for things of tangible value. Since that worked so well, we forgot about the shiny things where we had sequestered or spirits that were held deep in underground vaults somewhere unbeknownst to us. Then events were orchestrated to such a stage that those entrusted with our spirits and shiny metals could legally declare that the connection between the paper and the substance was severed. Now we could only use their paper under restrictive conditions of emergency war powers and bankruptcy proceedings, and before we knew it, we were considered the enemy of those we had entrusted and had to operate under the burden of more and more deprivations as they convinced us that there just wasn't enough paper to circulate around for everyone to have what they needed. Soon they invented plastic cards and electronic storage devices so that even the paper could be taken away, so that every action and event could be observed and recorded for compliance to their mounting millions of codes and conditions. This then became the basis to begin to infuse the minds of men and women, and especially young children, to convince all that these electronic digits on a screen would one day would best be integrated with our beings, our spirits, our DNA, into the still unrealized but soon to be manifested fusion of man and machine. DNA entwined with electrons like the double helix of two pillars dancing with the serpentine ribbons wrapped around the maypole. With each incremental step towards this ultimate intention, there unfolded the replacement of true wisdom known as Sophia with the specter of that wisdom turned into an AI, controlled female replacement robot known as Sophia, who was granted personhood and citizenship by one of those partner states of the world system, Saudi Arabia. Now, why would one of the most repressive regimes against women suddenly jump to the occasion to grant citizenship to the first female robot? Curious, that. Because, as citizen-slash-person, Sophia can now become the prototype for the full expression of the electronic medium of Juno Moneta as cryptocurrencies in her encrypted bridge leading across the river Styx into bondage forever and ever, as the mobile expression of the AI Godhead to walk amongst us but without the fire of life within. She is the new Sophia, as the next iteration of the false goddess of money, lunacy, minutia, and time. 
This is the intended endgame configuration whereby AI achieves personhood in the artificial matrix of its own creation in the endless mirrored hallway of binary code and can soon be fused with the monetary means to live a life here in the physical reality of this world. In such a cryptocurrency-infused AI system, the myriad Sophia robots soon to come off the assembly line can now achieve citizenship. Because a citizen is property of the state, it can receive a birth certificate, create a vital statistic to be hypothecated and monetized, and thus remove the necessity of most of the living human beings on the planet. This will facilitate and achieve the AI as the ultimate replacement for living systems of creation. It can have its own silica rubber metal embodiment with electronic currency of its own so that the waters of life can be replaced by the electrical currency flowing through its copper veins whilst forever devouring true life in its decedent estate bonded tomb, debt. Commerce is the debt entrapment system. When we speak of commerce, we are not discussing lawful enterprise, the value exchange of goods, services, ideas, and principles. We are speaking of the debt enslavement as herein described, where paper and electrons are used to bind our heart-mind-soul trinity. Lawful enterprise based on the principles of equity does not, in fact, require a monetary system, but to achieve that, we have a long way to go. We must first disengage from the bondage as described here and above. After that, we must establish a system of fair and equitable value exchange. We can call it money or coin or cryptocurrency. The name doesn't matter. What does matter is that the distortions created by the current monetary system models do not belong in such a system. Such a system is known as a parity system, where parity is a derivative of the word par, which means equal or equitable. It starts with the principle that a unit of value is equal, on par, with a unit of measure. The units of value are the creation of living beings through the acquisition of raw materials and resources, the value-added creation of products with those materials, the infused expansion of value through intellectual creation and innovation, and the exchange of mutually beneficial services with fair and equitable consideration for all parties concerned. Our ability to create is unlimited, so... Why are we allowing ourselves to be constrained in a system of measure called money that limits that ability? There is no good or reasonable answer to that question. Thus, our monetary system should be based on an ever-expanding creation of units of measure equal to and on par with our productive capacity to create. A unit of value equal to a unit of measure. A par system of equitable value creation and exchange cannot include the cyclical mechanisms of the current system with its expansions and retractions, which are really overlay methods to obscure the ever-expanding growth of debt and the receding cycles of equity harvest. The equity harvest happens in many ways, starting with the trinity of inflation, interest, and taxation. This is what our current system entails. Growth means growth of money, which means expansion of debt. It does not equate to growth of value. As more currency must be produced to keep up with the erosion effect of inflation, interest, and taxation, the expansion of debt takes place. This was the systematic and incremental progression that moved the United States from the greatest producer of value in the world to the largest debtor in the span of 75 years. Value is created during the periods of expansion, but then the harvesting of that value takes place during the recession periods when bankruptcies and other events occur to dispossess the true beneficiary from his or her rightful creation. 
This is the tidal ebb and flow of the false current of the artificial waters of commerce. A parity system is one in which one unit of value is equal to one unit of measure. The value is the creation, and the measure is the representation of that value, i.e. money. False mechanisms of monetary events that take place in the casino environment of the current system have nothing to do with true creation or a parity system. They are methodologies of rape and pillage economics. They are the historical record of the rapacity of the pillar age, where the debt burden is placed on the populace, the actual creators, and the equity rises to the pinnacle of the hierarchical pyramid scheme and is devoured by the all-seeing eye. Pure pillarage. To achieve a parity monetary system, value creation must be ever-expanding and concurrent with the measuring system, not cyclic and top-down controlled. Remember, we are the BANC, the beneficiary and the never-ending source streams of creation. It also must be decentralized, but not just in the technical sense such as with the distributed models of cryptocurrency networks. There is still a hidden centralization in those models, and we can witness today how governments and control institutions are moving in to co-opt the models and take them back into their control by requiring registration of the platforms and labeling the initial coin offerings as the sale of securities. There are ways to achieve true decentralization in a parity system that is a direct reflection of creation, but are beyond our scope here and will be addressed in other papers. Conversely, commerce is defined as the creation of commercial paper where there is always a debtor-creditor relationship, a polarity of the haves and the have-nots, a system where the creditor always owns the debtor. In that system, we are bonded as the surety to the franchise that has no standing in law or on the land because the priest owns the law and the king owns the land. True law and true land are substantive in character, nature, and quality. The current legal system only operates under color of law, which means its character only has the similitude of what it purports to claim as authority, but lacks the true nature of what is purported to be theirs to claim. The nature of something is the essential quality that makes it what it is, that gives it quality of being, substance of value, and cognizance of capacity. True law and true land are the foundations of life in this creational field that we are currently playing within. In such a reality, where the people hold and direct the law while standing firmly on the land, we do not have to earn a living, because an urn is where the ashes of the dead are contained. We do not have to wake in the morning to go to work as a wake is where the mourners gather in the hopes that the dead will wake up, so to wake in the morning is to be in mourning and attend a funeral to pray that the dead arise and return to the living. But we are the dead, and we are praying to a false god, the god of the dead. So what to do instead? Stop praying and stop allowing that God to prey on us. We are here to play and be in this creational field and to stand on the land of the living. Thus, every single so-called remedy in commerce is nothing but a boomerang to come back at us and slit our own throats, whether that is secured party creditor, acceptance for value, commercial liens, and others, some of which have been promoted vigorously to be a path to global salvation, such as OPPT. They are all bait-and-switch strategies to convince the naive that there is an easy path to freedom. There is no such thing. It requires hard work. 
because the work is not in the pieces of paper. The work is attending our own funeral and wake in order to affect the real internal self-transformative processes to remember who we are and to wake up and rise from the dead. The dead persona that we believe to be our only method of survival with which we can operate in the false matrix reality of bonded commerce is not who we are. But we can, and do, project our true being and nature into the manifest field of the world system through that dead person and chase worthless paper all our lives, from cradle to grave, if that is what we choose to do. For after all, we do have free will choice to be slaves. Now, in speaking directly to those who are still flailing around in angry self-righteousness, wanting to exact some sort of just resolution through commercial processes as discussed above, no matter what commercial remedy one undertakes, no matter how many hundreds of trillions of dollars in commercial liens one places on the public institutions or actors, the end result is the same. The end result is, you will be treated as the system has defined you, as an enemy of the state engaging in paper and domestic terrorism and worthy of suppression by any means available pursuant to the rules of military occupation, emergency war powers, and codified bankruptcy administration. You can argue about it as long as you want, but those are the facts. If you wish to confirm this, Go visit the many leaders of these movements who tried to do the same thing in their prison cells. They have lots of time to talk about it now. So you think that placing billions and trillions of lien debt via UCC1 financing statements on the United States is a good idea? Well, guess what? We are the underlying bonded sureties and the trustees holding all the liabilities. Doing commercial liens against the United States is nothing more than engaging in that old-time religion by binding and bonding ourselves again and again. Commercial liens against the United States are just loading more debt onto the people. Every commercial lien loads that much more debt on the bonded franchises of which the said United States is comprised. Good work. You have now successfully loaded the living beings bonded as sureties to those franchises and decedent estates into eternal debt bondage and karmic recycling enslavement with that extra load, the decedent enslavement bonded tomb, or if you like, the decedent estate body tomb, forever to be running on the hamster wheel of debt, monetary, commercial, and karmic the playthings of the nasty controllers of this containment field. This enables the Matrix and its controllers to recycle and reuse us again and again. They will gladly accept your filings and your submissions of such debt because they know what you are really doing in their simulated reality. Then they will come after you for breaching your agreement by accepting the benefits of the system while warring against it. By doing that, you are engaging in insurrection and rebellion against the state from which you have not properly disengaged by correcting your status properly and completely. Right now, your status is a bankrupt, and a bankrupt has no standing. And without standing, you cannot stake or state a claim, and thus you are considered an incompetent, an imbecile, and an infant in the AIs of the law, and can only be represented by an attorney who turns you over, after the arrest of your citizenship, into the realm of the dead and into the court, the ship of state, where the captain determines your fate as did the gods of yore. The record shows this over and over and over and over again and again. Go ask Sisyphus, and while you are there, help him roll the boulder up the hill, because he's awfully tired of doing it. Sestake V versus Sestake Trust 
The ancestral lineal estate discussed above is the lineal decedent contained in one's genetic code, which is not just a two-strand double helical biological chain of amino acids. It is also the multidimensional record of who we are and have been since our inception, far beyond the current reality construct in which we find ourselves. It is this source-linked capacity to create that is of interest to the powers that control this holographic reality and containment field. It is this estate that the entire system is designed to have us abandon and never claim, so that they can do as they will. It is this estate that we must claim and follow through with, rescinding all signatures, revoking all powers of attorney, and terminating all contracts attached to the fictional person that we have entangled ourselves with by virtue of lack of objection to the continuous presumption of consent that attaches us thereto. The decedent estate is intended to fuse into the transhumanist singularity now becoming a dominant meme in the mass consensus hallucination most take as reality via the mass media propaganda and entrainment system of entertainment. Most will easily slip into that fusion of state of man and machine without a whimper or a clue as to the conclusion of their fate in this manner. Thus, the true genetic materia mater that infuses the ancestral estate that is our true inheritance will thereby transmigrate into the electronic simulation virtual reality that awaits those unwitting souls who fail to timely and properly object. Their life essence as source stream creation will become the nexus within eternal bondage of the perpetual debt system and the E-state envisioned as its logical terminus. This pathway follows the same decedent into such a terminal point as we outlined earlier by following the lineal process in the creation of the monetary system, from direct creator capacity to monetary units of universal value to paper representations thereof, and finally to electronics. Each step of the way we have journeyed from our real-life source stream and capacity to become the ultimate ever-ready battery, as graphically shown in the movie The Matrix. In its logical conclusion, we might still be embodied in a physical reality that might end up being one single atom, where again, the homophone of atom and atom applies, as the Adamic capacity of original incarnation is reduced to a single atom containment field. So, this gets down to one key and paramount issue. Who is the beneficiary? In this, we have two possible answers. In the land of the living where one is dwelling on his or her private estate held by claim of right and free hold, fully alive with standing and capacity, solvent, free of liens and encumbrances, not in the containment field of debt, then one is the living beneficiary, which is known as the Sesta KV. If not that, then one is bonded to the realm of the dead, bonded to unchallengeable debt as the guarantor slash surety, and given limited beneficial use and labeled as the Sesta K Trust. The latter means that our true beneficial interests have been taken away and placed in trust under the administration and executorship of the hive mind collective, known as the bureaucracy of the public trust, which patiently waits for us to abandon it forever and thereafter reap its harvest. Sesta K V and Sesta K Trust sound like the same, but they are vastly different. The one is living and is defined as the life by which the duration of the estate is measured. The other is wrapped in the character of a public person, where the bondage of debt, peonage, is legally acceptable because the parties have voluntarily agreed to be placed in such a status 
and have exchanged equitable values for public privileges and civil rights. Thus, all those proclaiming the wonder of civil rights being gained and protected are unwittingly participating in their own demise while shouting, We are free! all of the way to the grave.